and not met a super hot girl at the party yesterday, surprisingly. <laughs> anyway, uh, thank, you, thank you all for waking up, despite your being over and stuff. Uh, we're going to try to uh, speak a bit about exploitation and cultural this. Before we starting, I would appreciate if you could give uh, a good clap to the organizer and the stuff, because uh, I think they've done an amazing job. This edition is sold out and stuff, it's just, just plain awesome. Uh, give me a call. <laughs> Managing to find a bar uh, to accept 600 smelly nerds in black t-shirts. When you try to, uh, we tried three bars after yesterday. We got thrown out, we were like four people. So yeah, having 600 people in one bar was really, really, pretty really awesome. <laughs> All right. So uh, I have a bit of a special story with Rockstar, um, so I'm French myself. I came master for the first time uh, for Rockstar. Basically, I wanted to uh, meet the uh, both the club, you know, pop the wire through. And uh, I ended up liking it so much that I actually settled in Australia. So uh, yeah, I have a bit of a special relationship to uh, the Rockstar conference. Um, so who am I? Yeah, I do a bit of... Um, Research. I just started my own company in Australia. Woo! Um, so yeah, I speak from time to time to different conferences and stuff. Uh, we do organize a, a conference in Paris. It's uh, there used to be another conference in Paris. It was in a military bunker organized by uh, Thales and military folks. We felt that uh, somehow we needed something different. So yeah, we have this uh, small conference called Architecture Gusto. It's definitely not as big as Rockstar, but if you guys want to submit and participate, you're most welcome. If you want to submit, like, you know, uh, capture the flag challenges or whatever, it's pretty cool. You could help us in the community, so. And, okay, I must admit I have, like, 90 plus slides, so I will definitely not put it to one hour. <laughs> and uh, if it's too easy, just let me know, and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll cut the crap and go directly to the meet. It really depends on you guys. Well, I'm at it. Uh, so I'm not a great fan of web application and stuff. Uh, you know, you have basically two kinds of security people. Those who try to be efficient and do web apps, and those who do it because they're fun and actually don't. Because reversing plain text is not that exciting. Uh, good news is if you're reading Doom in place, uh, Jeremy Grossman is actually uh, speaking at the conference. So if you need a new website with XSS and CSS or whatever, you just ask him. You're supposed to love you. <laughs> Alright, so we're going to go through a few basics, um, explaining what, what is the goal of the tool and stuff. Um, I, will, I will go into why we need to be environment aware when writing a debugger. Um, I will explain you a bit of the design of the tool, and then we'll go through demos and demos and demos. Um, the idea that so I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about the debugger today. Um, it's entirely open source and stuff. Uh, there is a repository in GitHub. So if you if you guys want to submit patches and participate, you can do it. We must Parker and Luigi actually just did it. And uh, finally, we will extend a bit the research to talk about stack desynchronization. If you have any questions or if I don't speak properly, which I think is something French, I'm drunk. Uh, just, just write a random or scream or whatever. Alright, so the tool is, uh, is already available on pncma.org. Um, we got like 10,000 downloads in the past uh, two months, which, which is very suspect, I must say, for a Linux reverse engineering tool. I did not expect to have that many. So, uh, yeah, Andrew G, you can, it's alright, you can, you, you can stop your bot by now. <laughs> Alright, so PMCMA is basically a pictures based debugger, and no, it's not like JDB. Um, basically, every, every debugger you would find uh, these days has been built with one goal in mind, which is about fixing software. So it's assuming that you have the source to get anything relevant out of it. And um, the test is going to do and stuff is, is basically tied to the factor of fixing. Um, I'm not that interested in fixing, to be honest. Uh, so, 
I faced a few, a few bugs which needed new exploitation techniques and to achieve this, I really needed my own debugger. So I started to experiment with that stuff and it turned out to be so cool that I thought like, okay, let's share it. So currently, um, the tool starts when, like, if you have a project session or whatever, we do do static, static analysis and you somehow manage to trigger your bug. Uh, I assume that the input the taking, the giving to the tool is actually already a, a proof of concept which should be able to crash the application. Uh, so the idea is like, based on this, can we find uh, ways to, um, like exploitation scenarios, um, um, which are viable, and can we actually uh, uh, test those scenarios um, uh, to come up with a working exploit? Um, so far, um, the exploitation is pretty tough, honestly, to uh, uh, automate from A to Z. If you're familiar with all the other exploitation techniques, like you know um, uh, symbolic execution, for instance, or uh, um, tracking uh, taint, taint, tainting analysis, uh, like known by uh, BS Demon on Frack in the latest Frack magazine, those are very complementary techniques in that uh, it tells you to basically fill the gap between, okay, I can crash the application and I would like the registers to worth like whatever, whatever uh, value. Uh, taint analysis can definitely help you find, okay, given this input, you need to modify the input in this way and that way to have this set of registers at any time. So uh, my tool is not capable of doing this, but um, these are like complementary techniques who already exist. So if we really want full automation, uh, it's definitely possible to uh, integrate those uh, complementary techniques to the tool. And there again, feel free to contribute patches. Uh, okay, if, instead of you know explaining what the tool does and stuff, it may be a bit abstract, I will give you a few demos. So okay, let's say we want to let's say we want to play with SSH. Yeah, one of the goals when you write a, a proper tool, um, I mean when you write a debugger or a reverse engineering tool, you'd like it to scale. Uh, there are so many projects who are you know very cool, but you know only work on football or or you know can um, I have some examples in mind you know like tools to unstrip like reconstruct a, a, a symbol table for instance and uh, even if you try it on linear it's not working okay honestly it's definitely not my goal here I want something which scales so we're gonna try in real binaries like SSH sounds good or do you want Apache or whatever do you want a beer? <laughs> Okay, SSH. So my current process ID is this one. We're gonna create a new session somewhere. So I don't really need uh, I don't really need a, a proper SSH connection. I'm just gonna uh, create a TCP connection to uh, force SSH default. And we're gonna analyze the, the, uh, the process ID of the new created fork. Alright, so I should have a new process ID. That one. Okay, it's typically privileged, so we need some uh, we need to be able to run the tool. Okay, um, Okay, please uh, give, give your hand to, your, to your, the person next to you. We're going to prize all together. We're going to pray. <laughs> uh, it's supposed to work here. Uh, yes, okay. So the analysis starts by, okay, it's telling me that uh, it's, it's finding me the process ID, stuff like this, all fine. The state of registers, so GDB will give you this. Uh, it's checking that the stack has not been has not been smashed. You do this basically by walking back the, the stack, trying to find the same DDP, same VIP, and you try to uh, go back from frame to frame. If you manage to do this like 
x times, it means that basically you did not smash the stack. Here we managed to do it three times. Okay, then the application, right, in this case the application didn't crash. Normally, uh, uh, when, when you get a bug, uh, it will do much like uh, being exploitable for Microsoft trying to tell you, okay, why, why did it crash? So we give you a proper example today. Then we check a bunch of uh, binary properties. Most familiar, for instance, with CIE. Wow, that many people, <laughs> God. Position independent and ex executable, never heard of that? Okay, so we'll keep the back of slides, sorry. Uh, stack cookies, you know what stack cookies? SSP propolis. Wow, cool, okay. <laughs> so those are basically like uh, security protections, like stack cookies is like, you know, the, the fact of getting a random cookie uh, uh, on top of your stack to prevent stack smashing. Um, Fortify source is like one of the latest uh, um, merging to GCC, which allows when you have a, a, a static stack, you know, when you have a static buffer in the stack, so automatic variable, uh, and it's left is static, and so you cannot like move the stack pointer or stuff like this, so it's static. Then the size of the copy is known in advance, and uh, what GCC does is actually adding a, an extra parameter to many functions like memcopy. So instead of actually call, calling memcopy, it's going to call memcopy underscore chk. Uh, proper binary, which takes another argument, which is the size of the static buffer. So this totally prevents stack overflows in some cases, right? It only works for stack variables, so it does not prevent like heap corruption or data corruption or other writable section corruption. But it's pretty efficient for stack variables if they have like uh, uh, constant size. Yep. Yeah, any question? All good. Relocation. What's relocation? Wow, you guys are super drunk too. Okay. <laughs> so partial red row, it's like the fact of putting uh, writable sections before executable sections. In this case, if you have an overflow, let's say in the BSS section, the standard technique would be to override the uh, destructor, so detour section, which contains a function pointer. If you put the BSS section before the executable section, you cannot do that anymore. Because if you try to overwrite, you will first need to overwrite, say, dot text which is not writable, and this will just kill your exploitation technique. So uh, most binaries on Ubuntu, Debian, whatever, Fedora, are now compiled with partial relocation, which is the fact of putting the writable section before the executable one. Full relocation? Anybody familiar with full relocation? Good. So full relocation is basically the fact of having a static global offset table. Uh, uh, so static link, it's a dynamic linker when you run an application has to find, say, printf in your C library. To do this, it uses the processing cache table and the global offset table. The idea is that if you do all the relocations before actually running the uh, executable and jump into the entry point of your library, uh, you can remap the whole global offset table as static, which prevents, uh, you know, in case you have an arbitrary right somewhere, like uh, say you have a, a, a missing format strict bug and you can write anywhere, you can write whatever you want, anywhere you want in memory, you cannot hijack an entry in the global asset table to, for instance, redirect printf to your shell code. So that's also a, a, a sorry, full, uh, full relocation is also a prevention of uh, entire classes of exploitation uh, scenarios. Executable stack. I hope people are at least familiar with this. It's, uh, uh, so it's like the fact of uh, having either uh, software-based or hardware-based non-executable sections. Back in the days, everything used to be executable, which means anything mapped inside the binary was executable. So like you know your variables and uh, so being it in uh, read-only read data, normal data, or just as a section or even the heap used to be executable. From an exploitation perspective, this is uh, uh, pretty good, but from a security perspective, not so much. So we introduced either software-based uh, solutions like Pax or hardware-based like the NX bit in Intel or uh, AMD equivalents. Actually, it's AMD and uh, uh, Intel. 
itself for bit zero. Why is it interesting to uh, check if your binary is actually written in C++? Why do you care? C++ rely massively on C, yes, <laughs> on function pointers. So yeah, uh, if your binary is compiled with, uh, uh, I mean, is a C++ executable, everything which is like connected uh, uh, will actually be a function pointer, most probably in the E. So uh, if we can uh, overwrite arbitrary E sections, it's pretty interesting to know that uh, the binary will be filled with function pointers. Okay, so those are the main checks done by the... Those are really prerequisites, right? If you want to write any exploit, if you don't know those properties, it's basically just not possible. So then King CMA checks a few things like, you know, is the binary actually uh, 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 privileged? Like, uh, what are its real user ID, group ID, uh, effective, uh, effective group ID, and, and the previous ones, saved ones. <coughs> then it checks a bunch of things regarding ESLR. I'll get back to this. You guys are familiar with the randomization, right? Yeah, yeah cool. Okay. Okay, and then uh, if, if you have used uh, something like Pax test, which is uh, a sort of regression test tube in Pax. Uh, and geosecurity. Um, it tells the uh, um, PMCMA as to also know, like, you know, is your if executable, uh, is your data executable. It's pretty tough to say because it depends on both the software you're using, like what is the, the exact version of your kernel, what is the configuration of your BIOS, uh, even if you have physical capabilities of NX uh, at CPU level, if it's not if it's disabled in the BIOS, it's not going to be active and your heap is so it's worth a try. And uh, the last check we do is actually trying to execute all the sections after a uh, protect. Um, usually, if you have a writable section and you uh, try to change its permissions using mprotect, for instance, to change the section from uh, writable to executable, which would be pretty heavy if you want to execute your own shellcode. Um, Usually it works. Thing is, with some version of GR security in pretty hardcore mode, you can disable this. In the sense, uh, you can you can you can be sure that any writable section will never be executable again. So we need to check this. Yeah, stop smiling. I know I'm creating over. It's alright. Any questions so far? Okay, that was slide two. So good news. Alright. Uh, I had a few goals in mind when writing the tool. Okay, honestly, I had a few bugs I could not exploit uh, manually, so I thought, like, okay, I need a tool. There is one thing I did not want it to do, which was stack overflows. But when I needed the tool, every second guy was sending me an email, like, hey, you know, I tried the tool with a, 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 and it doesn't work. Alright, so I, I, I actually worked a bit on stack overflows, but I'm, I'm going to show you what happened with stack overflows. Uh, most of the research I could have is actually uh, 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 stuff done by Ben Oaks um, uh, back in 2006. I thought it was uh, Andrew G who uh, disposed it last year for two brief stack cookies in particular. And uh, the guys, uh, the guys um, at uh, KiwiCom in particular, the guys from Wilson, I told them why well, they're hallucinating. We knew that for ages. And yeah, Ben Oaks actually showed this job exactly five years ago at Rockstar. So. Okay, um, so I'm going to give you a small demo of um, Stack Overflows. So most of the attack relies on the fact that um, when you have a server in the Linux, it's most probably going to fall. Uh, we don't use multi train that much, unless you really need zillions of connections at a time. If you need more than 10,000 connections at a time, um, then it's not a good idea to fork because uh, each fork will need its own PID process ID and it's pretty tough to uh, uh, allocate that many process IDs. So for instance, like HTTPD or Nginx, uh, 
our, our web servers who actually aim at breaking these 10,000 connection limits do not use forking. That being said, um, so the idea is like if you use if you use fork, the mapping of your binary is going to be exactly the, map, the mapping of the original binary, right? Because fork is not uh, uh, changing memory alignment or whatever. It's just creating a proper replica of the original um, uh, process. This is pretty bad because if you have a stack cookie or uh, Volus Uno randomization, it means that the randomization in both processes are going to be exactly the same. If we look at the um, existing production, so we have NX, we can pretty much assume that NX is going to be there, right? Non execution of writable section. Stack cookies, uh, it's, it's default um, since GCC 4.2, so you can assume it's going to be there anyway. Randomization is pretty much always there unless you have a very, very old kernel. Position independence executable is something someone new. It's like the fact of compiling your main binary pretty much like a shared library in the sense it can be loaded as any, any position in the, in the mapping of your process. Which you know, if you don't have this, like your shared libraries are going to be randomized, but the main binary is going to be static. So uh, if you have any kind of corruption, uh, you can use by um, uh, red to PLC, which means instead of who's familiar with red to UC. Bullshit series. <laughs> wow, red to UC, return to return to library. <laughs> okay, well for this we know uh, you can if you don't have position independent executable, you can actually return to the PLT. Uh, instead of returning to the uh, to the um, UC, which is randomized. So the idea is that uh, if you have say an entry to mprotect and any copy primitive like printf, uh, sorry, sprintf, or um, you know uh, uh, string copy whatever in the PLT, you can pretty much manage to uh, copy your shell code to any writable zone and then call mprotect from the PLT to uh, uh, remap this section as executable instead of writable, and then uh, return to it. If you have position independent executable, you cannot return to the PLT anymore because it's randomized. Static, uh, static got, we don't care so much unless you plan to use uh, return-oriented programming. A good trick with uh, rock is actually to read the value from the got Say your binary is actually not, it, uh, it does not have M protect in its, uh, if your binary is not calling M protect at all, you will not have uh, a PLT entry for M protect. Well, I'd still very much like to call M protect. So the idea is that I could, using rock gadgets, try to read any entry in the global offset table, add it, so it's gonna, it's gonna point to an address in libc, say the address of printf, the distance from printf to mprotect is actually constant because it's, 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 you know, it's combined with C. So if I manage to find route gadgets to read an arbitrary dot position, I need a constant value which is the offset from printf to mprotect and patch it back to printf the global, uh, in the global offset table. Next time I'm going to call printf, I'm actually going to call mprotect. So the idea is that using this trick, uh, um, you can, you can call using uh, red to PLT functions which are not called normally by the binary. If you have a static global offset table, it's not possible anymore. That being said, there is also a trick which is to find a gadget that does, for instance, call EAX, and uh, you don't need to patch back to the global offset table anymore. What's SKR Sorry? Everybody knows. That's all good then. That's good. Uh, it's the fact of having uh, your shared libraries and your main binary if it's compiled position is independent executable. At the memory location, we start with 0, 0. The idea being uh, if you have a stack overflow using, say, string copy, uh, it's going to end at the first occurrence of 0, 0. So if you need to copy any address in your stack, for instance, because you want to do uh, a red to libc, uh, if it con 
contain zero uh, for entire <coughs> classes of functions who are basically ASCIIs uh, um, capable, you will not be able to uh, write a proper exploit at all. Actually, if you combine this with stack cookies, the stack cookie always contains zero for the Linux and, and the BSD2. So um, uh, if you cannot compute zeros, basically, uh, you're fucked. It's not exploitable at all. If you have uh, other uh, function monads, zero sensitive, like uh, name copy, then you don't care. It's just that basic the whole thing. So I'm saying it's cheesy. I'm, I'm really going to show you the, the exploit. But like, it's cheesy because you can do this only by static analysis. You don't need to actually run the binary to write a proper exploit. And you can actually also write an exploit, which is going to be generic enough to work with you know, any kind of compilation. Like, is it compiled with PIE, without PIE? Is it another program, like an FTP server, whatever? It doesn't matter. There is a, a proper generic exploit, which I have somewhere here. So I'm going to run the... Uh, first, I'm going to show you the compilation properties. Right, so the binary is actually compiled with uh, position independent executable, uh, it has an enable, it has stack cookies, and it has full relocation, which means standard plot. So that's pretty much as hardcore as it gets. The only additional protection you could get is uh, Fortify source. Um, problem is, Fortify, uh, like we said previously, in many cases do not apply. In the sense, if you're not copying to uh, a, a destination in the stack with a predictable size, then mProtect will just not apply. With very late, so let's move on. Okay, here is a server. So it's, a, it's just a dummy server, right? Like, uh, it's waiting for a connection. It says it's prompting for, for a password. Sorry, a login and a password, right? Yeah, I have a fantasy with them at the moment for some reason. Alright. So I'm going to keep this stuff running in one window. I'm just going to run the exploit. I moved it in the morning for some reason, that was really stupid, but anyway. So, so we can brute force the canary. The idea is to brute force it uh, by the byte. That was a mighty idea from uh, Ben Holtz. What's actually not known is that you can actually also brute force uh, the same EIP in your stack, which means uh, if you get a bug in the uh, libc, you will get the address of the libc right away, so you don't need to brute force anything. Or if the crash happens in the main binary, you will get the mapping of the main binary, even if you have position independent executable enabled, which means if you want to do red to uh, PLT or uh, uh, find gadgets in the main binary, you always win. Uh, so then we need a few exploit parameters, whatever, okay. In this case, uh, I'm using um, the standard uh, red to libc uh, uh, technique, which is basically copying every byte of your shellcode to um, um, a writable section. So you use 
either the BSS of the main binary or the BSS of the C, if you can find the address of the C. And um, so the, the only problem with this job is that uh, the, the exploit is pretty big. In the sense you fail all these, uh, you have 130 something bytes, and it's actually going to get bigger. Let's praise the more God. Give your name to your neighbor, seriously. <laughs> we should somehow get a shell. Yeah, install. Okay, so I should have now uh, a proper visual. It's that. No, you're not praying to the more gods, you know. I'll get back to this later. The idea is that, um, so this exploit is normally pretty reliable, as you can see. <laughs> the only problem is that um, if you need to send, say, uh, uh, 2,000 bytes uh, in the stack um, to, to copy every, every bit uh, of your exploit and byte to byte your exploit, uh, which means you basically have one stack frame, one, by, one copy byte, uh, uh, this is totally not realistic in the sense uh, most most of the flows you get are like you know, by a few bytes and not by two thousand bytes. So um, what's the contribution to this? Well, a good idea, for instance, is uh, instead to returning to mem copy or string copy or whatever to copy the to copy uh, byte to byte, is just to return to receive. If you return to receive, then you give it as parameters like uh, first parameter, the address of the DSS, uh, second parameter, no, first, first the address of the socket which is already open, second the address of the DSS, and third the size of your shellcode. Basically what the program will do is wait for you to send the shellcode in uh, an, the end of the send, and you can copy the entire shellcode at once using only one stack frame which reduces the size of the exploit of the payload from 2,000 or whatever bytes to just, uh, I managed to do it in 45 bytes, which is like a lot less. Okay, we'll give a bit of back to this demo uh, eventually. So like I said, like Stack Overflow was really not my main focus uh, in the sense I think it's pretty well documented and you can do this using static analysis only. If you check like the addresses or, uh, you know, uh, the function called in your PLT, they do a few rock gadgets uh, in your uh, main binary, and you find the uh, addresses of every function in your libc, you pretty much set to write your exploit. So you don't need uh, you don't need the dynamic analysis at all. Do we go through the basics? Who knows assembly? Any kind of assembly. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, you know what? We're pretty late. Uh, I'm gonna. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so I assume you guys know why application crash. Um, okay, you know, memory basically you have read, write, and execute permission, and if you try to dereference memory in the wrong wrong way, uh, you'll get a segmentation fault. It's all you need to know. In this, uh, well. Um, so, for those not familiar with assembly, assembly in a nutshell in two seconds. Assuming Intel, um, Intel syntax, you always have the instruction you're executing, so in this case it's compare. Then you have the destination operand, in this case it's EBX plus 8, and you have the source operand, in this case it's 9. It means that if you have, if you have a mob, for instance, a, a move instruction, this would be the source, like you know, where are you copying from memory or what register, and this would be where you're writing. And when you have brackets like that, it means like it's pretty much like in C, uh, a dereferencing a pointer. This means you're not copying memory to a register, you're actually writing to memory. So uh, if you have a mob over there, 
that would be a right instruction because this is the destination and this is where the brackets are. Okay? If you have the brackets on the on the side, this is the read. Here is a comparison instruction, so it's not writing anything anywhere. It's just actually subtracting 9 from the memory location written as EDX plus 8 and it compares only one byte. Easy, cheesy. Alright, now that everybody's familiar with assembly, we get to the real thing. Alright, so let's say, um, let's say, you know, we've been, we've been trying to fuzz, for instance, um, you know, random program in the Windows or whatever. One guy. <laughs> this is a fashion show or something? <laughs> Most of the bugs you get these days are not stack overflows. This is why I'm not interested that much in stack overflows in the first place. Most of the bugs you get are actually not exploitable. Uh, it's like, you know, you're reading from the first page, the first page being never mapped on the Linux, thank you. Uh, so, like, if you read, if you can read from, uh, you know, just a, a, a memory location you do not control, and this location is never going to read that, uh, whatever you do, basically this is not exploitable. Um, if you, so slightly more interesting bugs are bugs where you can write anywhere in memory, and where hopefully you have some control over the registers. This happens a lot, uh, as opposed to uh, uh, stack control these days. We find each of them. If you do some fuzzing, you will find like a shitload of reads and maybe a few writes which may be exploitable. And this is where we lay actually proper methodology. It's like, okay, um, so I have a set of registers. My application is dying on mob EAX with brackets, which means I'm writing to it, uh, and it's writing the content of PBX. If I control both EAX and PBX entirely, I can write four bytes anywhere I want in memory. Architecture. Yes? Yes. If I do that, where do I want to write? I'm open to suggestions. The next instruction. You would like to write the next instruction. So, so like um, the dot text of your binary. It's a pretty good idea because it's executable, but it's a terrible idea because yeah, it's not writable. No, it's not read-only, but it's, it's executable and not writable. So you cannot do this. Uh, maybe you could back in the days, and maybe you can on other CPUs, like microcontrollers, I think you can. But definitely not on Intel. Now, the standard technique, come on, like if you have a missing format string, for instance, like, uh, you'd like to attack the detour section, which contains an obvious function pointer, or you'd like to uh, hook a global acceptable entry, like patch printf, and you say, hey, it's normal printf, it's my chunk code, right? <laughs> Thing is, if the god is static, you cannot do this anymore, and um, you can actually remove the detour section entirely using a uh, custom linker script. It's not standard yet, but uh, it's doomed to arrive. So we need better exploitation techniques. If I can write anywhere in memory where I really want to write, it's find a function pointer. Because if I find a function pointer, I overwrite my function pointer with my arbitrary content, I make it point to my shellcode, right? Assuming that my shellcode is somehow executable and writable, which is not realistic, but I'll get back to this later. If I hook a function, oh, what's a function pointer? <laughs> what's a function? <laughs> Right, the function pointer is basically like uh, uh, a, a, a four byte value, which is in the writable section, right? And which is pointing to executable code. Sure? So, having those definitions in mind, it's probably not the one your teacher gave you, but it's, it's a pretty good and, and, and correct one. What we'd like to do is find all the function pointers in memory. What the problem with this? There are a couple of scripts in Python and stuff where you can see we can do this. You know how many? What? There are too many. Yeah, it's one problem. Well, they're not all concentrated in one space either. Hey, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We did 10 slides, I think. Woo! I think French on me. The problem with finding function pointers is basically if you do static analysis only, you will find a shitload of them, correct? 
but actually in this list, you don't know which one actually going to be called. Given a, a, a one input, you will not call every function pointer possible inside the application, right? So uh, this is this is a pretty tough problem. I don't know. My battery is not working for some reason. Can you check that out? Thanks. All right. So. What I'd really like to do, actually, what's the slides to me? Um, what I'd really like to do is, is list all those function pointers, and to do that, I need some of uh, a proper debugger. And this is where GDB is not helping me. The concept of PMCMA is basically a normal, a normal debugger works like this. You have your debugger, which is debugging another application. So you type a few comments, blah, blah, blah. Your application dies. And it's over. You need to restart. And the mapping of the debug process is going to be different. Like all the SLR property alignment, etc., are going to be different. So I don't want to do that. What I'd really like to do is have my debugger, who's debugging my process, and I want to have as many tries as I want. Like I want to write the memory, and if I make a mistake, I want to try again. So one option to do this is actually uh, using, for instance, VMware, which has uh, uh, you can take snapshots. And you use GDB plus VMware, and you can uh, get back to the previous situation. There are a couple problems with this. First off, you need to know what uh, is the previous situation, which means you need to be able to take a snapshot before crashing, which is not always possible. Yeah. And the other problem is that it's slow as shit. I mean, seriously, you don't want to do that. So the good idea is what? You have a debugger. You're debugging a process. This process, we're going to force it to fork. So we inject a shell code inside this process, it goes forth, and we patch back, and a few bytes get patched. This creates a proper replica of the previous process, an exact replica, meaning byte per byte, you know, like writable sections are exactly in the same states, variable are exactly in the same states, stack cookies are going to be the same. It's a proper replica. So I, if I can make one fork, I can actually make one million forks if I want. So I make as many forks as I want. And in each of these processes, if I have an arbitrary write, the only locations I can actually try to write to, to write an exploit, are not the dot text section, like I suggested earlier, because it's an executable section. I can only write to writable sections. Yeah, high five. So, all good? <laughs> <laughs> so the idea is that uh, if I can if I can write only to writable memory, I'm gonna create as many forks as possible memory location to overwrite. And I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna overwrite every possible location. In each of the process, I'm gonna overwrite only four bytes at a different location each time. And I overwrite it with something remarkable. So a good value would be, for instance, f1, f2, f3, f4, because one, it's easy to find out, right, so it's canary. And it's always pointing to, what, ring three? It's always pointing to kernel then, whatever, is, whatever your kernel split is. So basically, if you're trying to execute memory location f1, f2, f3, f4, it will never work from user end, right? So let's sum it up. I take, I have my debugger, I'm debugging a process, I make it work one zillion times, I have exact copies of it. In the first one, I overwrite the first four bytes in writable memory with F1, F2, F3, F4. In the second one, I leave the first four bytes alone, but the next four bytes I overwrite with F1, F2, F3, F4, etc. Right? Up to the latest possible. And I keep on executing this job. If I overwrite a function pointer, what's going to happen? Crash, yeah, executing which instruction? Uh, when it tries to execute these lines, it's going to It's going to try to execute uh, memory location F1, F2, F3, F4, which is pretty remarkable, right? So my debugger will be able to find the function pointer. If I have a function pointer and I overwrite it with F1, F2, F3, F4, There is implication and there is also like the reciprocity. So it's a sound 
methodology. You can find all the function points of the database. Okay, first the slides. Uh, we're gonna go through a few demos, which will possibly work. Please give your hand to your neighbor. Right. Let's do it with SSH. It would be great. Alright, so I'm going to create a new connection. This is good bit. Okay. So we will assume that uh, SSH, let's say that right now I can crash SSH because I have a uh, uh, small bug in it. I can, so not a stack control or something very obvious, but like I can, you know, like either create a invalid memory read or invalid memory write. So what I'd like to know is can I find all the function pointers? Power failure, awesome, best time ever. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm a bit sorry about this. <coughs> you did not give your hand if you don't involved, you know, that's fine. <laughs> All right, so the idea that uh, PMCMA is normally capable of listing all this stuff, I entitle you to try and you know, tools by yourself. Another problem which we commonly find is actually uh, when we have a lot less control over the application. Here I've been assuming that, okay, I have someone like mob into EAX, register EDX, which means I control, if I control EDX and EAX, I can write anywhere a full byte, uh, full byte whatever in memory, right? Many times you don't have that much control, which means, for instance, you don't control what value is going to be written in memory. In this case, what would you like to do? Apart from the video. The idea that uh, if I cannot overwrite a function pointer with the exact address of my shellcode, uh, basically, I don't want to overwrite the function pointer at all. So, uh, there, is a, there are other methodologies we could think of, like pointer truncation. If I can only write zero, that's the reason why I wrote PMC in the first place. I had a really cool bug, but I could only write zero on four bytes aligned boundaries, which means you're, you can write uh, a 32 entity, which is only zero. So if you find a function pointer and you overwrite it with zero, you're going to try to execute the first page of the memory, which we said is never math. Unless you have a very old kernel before 23, or you're running as root and you're a tender head and you're mapping zero, which is fucking stupid. So basically, if I cannot uh, uh, override this function pointer, maybe I can try to truncate it. Mm -hmm. If actually I can write only on 32, 32 bit aligned boundaries, I won't find function pointer you want because your compiler even if you're using a not too good compiler like GCC, it's going to make sure that your function pointers are aligned for performance reasons. Yes? Yes. So, uh, in this case, what we'd what we like to do is still truncate the variable. Yeah, no. I mean, take as long as you want. Oh, good. Okay, so. You're awesome, <laughs> <laughs> I'm also, man. Good so demos today. Good demos. <laughs> and this would be like two minutes. Uh, so the idea is that if I cannot override a function pointer, what I could try to do is override another um, um, variable, but it has to be misaligned. I can only write to align memory. How do you find misaligned memory? Like you know, read, read or write to memory which is not aligned. 
Is this common? Is this common? No idea? It's not really common because it's costly for the CPU. So most variables are actually aligned. If you'd like to do it, there's actually a neat trick, and we'll get into more right? It's to set a uh, uh, um, um, align flag in the if flag register, which is a special control register, if you will, for those who are not talking about assembly. If you set the align register and you execute an instruction which reads or writes from unaligned memory, you're going to get a signal 7, which is Bus. Thank you. If you get so, <laughs> by doing this repeatedly, it's possible to actually find all the memory reads or memory writes to underlying memory. So if I can only write a constant value to a given location, what I try to do is find an, uh, an underlying read, for instance, overwrite the value which is going to be read but truncated, it's misaligned. My right is always aligned, so I'm actually going to truncate it, right? And pray so that the uh, next few instructions actually do this um, um, overrated value to do something interesting, like to copy to a buffer, something like this. This is also fully automated with PMCMA, and since we won't have time for a demo, uh, I tell to you to try this at all. So one more thing, uh, which I scared for those who actually follow the bit. Who did follow the bit? Yeah, two guys. Woo! <laughs> I, I skipped some read part. I said, okay, if I override the function pointer, I can make it point to my own shellcode. And you should say, bullshit. Because your shellcode is not going to be executable. It's going to be in a writable section, right? So actually what you'd like to do, is not to return to your shellcode directly, but return, for instance, to another function problem. Let's say your current stack frame, as you're calling uh, mcopy, is uh, 40 bits, sorry, 40 bytes long. If you return to a function problem who's not actually of 40 bytes, anybody know what's a function problem here? Yeah? Yes, I did for in my debugger. Like in real life, if I want to uh, uh, attack uh, um, SSH, I cannot attach via debugger, right? So they're like, yeah, the, the shell I use for my debugger, I did inject it uh, via the trace. So why can't you execute it? Yeah, in my debugger I can, but not in real life. So like, you know, uh, the debugger is basically for prototyping, and once you're actually uh, uh, attacking the real, I mean, if you have P-trace, if you can actually p trace into SSH on a remote server, uh, you don't need an exploit man. <laughs> so the thing is, but that was a good question, thank you. If I can send my uh, um, you know my shell code over a socket, it's gonna be copied most probably in the heap, maybe in the stack. Correct? So it's in a writable section which is not executable. Um, if I manage to somehow uh, um, um, trigger a bug, which is an invalid memory write, and I find a function pointer to overwrite, I can overwrite my function pointer, but not to point to my shellcode, because my shellcode is in a writable section, and it's not executable. So if I do that, I just get a same notation point, and no, pro and no proper execution of my shellcode. Unless you have a very old camel on the bottom, okay? So uh, uh, in this case, what you can do, do is try to desynchronize the stack. Instead of returning to uh, a, a function prolog of the same size, you return to a function prolog of a different size. If you do this, the save the IP, save the DP, etc. are going to be completely wrong. Sure? And if you can make it point to your own fake stack frame, like for instance on the E or on the stack itself, then you're set. Right? So the idea is like, instead of trying to execute shellcode directly, uh, what we're going to try to do is uh, uh, return to uh, create a fake stack frame. And we're back to the problem of um, um, stack overflows. In the sense, creating fake stack frames, we can do this entirely static with static analysis. So it's easy, like finding function pointers is something we can do like 
in very little amount of time, like basically in one pass of disassembly. Good? Cool? Do we have time for demos or no? Jeremy? Oh, my hook. For you? <laughs> for you? For me, you do it? You're five minutes, sir. Ah, you're right. Oh, while you say that up, does anyone have, have like, a really quick question for Johnson? Yeah, like writing shell code with the trades. Yeah. <laughs> you know, apparently once you have root, you can get root really easily. Good <laughs> 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 one. <laughs> no way. I'm, I'm going to use another version of PFC and maybe I'm not using the correct one. Uh, we bought it to start to 64 uh, bit, by the way. And uh, it's supposed to be ported to uh, BSD and uh, uh, OSX pretty soon when I have time. This is pretty cool that you can play with that whole Yeah, so uh, it's uh, Apache 2 license, so it's entirely uh, free software. It's available on pncma.org and it's available on the GitHub. You can also submit patches and stuff. You just copy the git and read your, your stuff and I just need it to accept your version. Alright, so we have some problem with SSH, we'll still try with SSH. Because it's cool. Wow. Wow. You need a pay of a flag. No, my ATM and is like not resolved. I think the demo guards are pretty angry at us because we got two more tests today. <laughs> right. I'm gonna use I'm gonna use Adobe uh, application. We're gonna use uh, you know what? I'm gonna debug my slides. I'm gonna debug uh, Expedia. Right. So here is a beautiful thing. Uh, could all you newcomers um, please shut up? <laughs> and please, please give your hand to your neighbor. Very important. So PMCNA, I write the pin here. Okay, we just do the basic analysis. It's going to find me hopefully the function pointers. So it starts by uh, the same analysis as previously. Thank God we had time to do this. I did not explain you ASLR or to find like the most probable address. Basically, you, are, you execute the same binary 100 times, you record the mapping, and you check if they change. Uh, if one of the mapping is like more likely to happen, you want to you want to take a function function in that mapping because your exploit is going to be more reliable. Uh, hopefully, if it's like 100% replicable, well, you have a proper reliable exploit. So here we're analyzing all the writable sections. It's in a one-pass thing. What we do is try to check if any 32-bit value is actually pointing to executable memory. If it does, it's potentially a function pointer. So we save it for later. And uh, when we enter in the second phase of the uh, debugger, we're going to overwrite successfully in a different fork that we have injected via the trace to IPN, and uh, we're going to try to override successfully all the possible function pointers with uh, this canary value of f1, 2, f3, f4 and check out if they are actually uh, uh, the reference. So there are a few additional things like we can check if the crash is happening in the loop or not, which is pretty important. Like, is it, is it an atom drive or is it actually a node flow? Which one's better, atom drive or node flow? You say the hour flow is better. You think the atom drive is better. <laughs> You're not helping. <laughs> now, usually an hour flow is better because you can override the whole section and you don't really need to spot your uh, 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 function pointer to it. And second thing, if you have uh, an hour flow, you actually don't give a fuck about a randomization most of the time. In the sense, you don't need to find it in memory at all. You just override it faster. It's hard to find another flow because of computing power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Big memory, big everything. Because it's more space. 
Yeah. yeah. So, well, you okay. This is all right. So, well, since we're using mostly 64 architecture, mostly for servers. Yeah. The other space is bigger, but the yeah, but the SSH you're executing, for instance, is still pretty much the same size, right? So the actual memory which is mapped in memory is the same, like a few, a few megabytes to a few hundred megabytes if you instance deep, deep spread. So the idea is that, yeah, it, it's kind of tough to find a location, but if you have an overflow, um, say you have a, a, a BSS overflow, for instance, uh, because you're writing to uh, you know, um, um, global, global uninitialized memory. If you have a BSS overflow, uh, uh, the size of the BSS is going to be the same. And if you, have, if you find something which is static, because for instance, uh, uh, um, so either you also find a uh, stack overflow and you can use the previous technique I showed you uh, to brute force not only the stack IP but also the save IP. So you find the location of save IP and you can get back to anything inside the main binary. Or uh, if uh, one of uh, if the binaries, for instance, that take without PIE is going to be mapped at a given location, even if you have a very big other space, it's going to be mapped always the same, uh, at the same location. Anyway, so we found um, thousands of possible pointers, and we tried to derive them, and I should really piss off. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so normally here, uh, it's going to list you like uh, all the function pointers uh, it's going to find. Very spread lengthy because we found uh, thousands of them, and yeah, my demo totally sucked. Thank you for coming. <laughs> <laughs>